Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 16, of course, this is a, there's a lot here in this chapter, um, you know, more than I could even get to in one sermon. I mean, we could talk about every one of these feasts and there's so much symbology and so many things we could just unpack um, from each one of these uh, feasts that are mentioned there. But if you look there <clears throat> in verse 16, it says, uh, three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God at a place which he shall choose. And of course, you know, that was the tabernacle and Shiloh and other places and eventually was the temple at Jerusalem. That was the place that the Lord chose to put his name there. And then he mentions that there are, now that's true, he says there, there are three times that all the males shall appear before the Lord thy God. But that's not to say that there were only three feasts. There are actually, what we're going to cover tonight, are seven feasts of the Lord. Because in several of those feasts, you had more than one feast taking place. There was a lot of overlap. For example, uh, the first one they, they mentioned there in the month Abib is you know you, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then, of course, elsewhere you'd see the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the wave offering. So there's actually, uh, there's actually three feasts, really, in that one time that they would appear. And then in the middle of the week, they had the Feast of Weeks, right? They were to count 50 weeks uh, from, the the last, uh, from the Passover. And then they would come again and they would present themselves uh, for another feast. And then at the end, there was another feast, of course, which was, uh, you had the, uh, it ended with the, uh, uh, we're going to get into it here in a minute, but it had, uh, <laughs> it was the gathering, I'm, I'm, I'm messing up here already, but it's the, the Feast of Tabernacles is what they call it. But of course you had, uh, there were several more components that were involved in that too. There was three different feasts in those. So it's true that they're only supposed to show up three times in the, uh, in the year, but we have to remember there, that doesn't mean there was only three feasts. There's actually three, uh, there was three in the beginning and three at the end and the one in the middle. So they'd actually had seven, fe uh, seven feasts uh, between those three times. So uh, the first one they mentioned there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? So if you look there in verse one, it says, Observe the month Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord thy God. For in the month Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover in the Lord thy God of the flock and the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to put his name there. There shall uh, no leavened bread be in it with it. Seven days shalt thou eat uh, unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. So they had the Passover. They would eat that. And then, of course, they had the seven days of unleavened bread. So there was two feasts there. <coughs> he said there in verse 3, um, going on, For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, and that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. There shall no leaven be bread seen uh, with thee in all thy coasts seven days. Neither shall there uh, anything of flesh which thou sacrificest the first day at even remain all night until the morning. Thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within thy, any of thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee, but at the place where the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in, there shalt thou sacrifice the Passover even, and at the going down of the sun at the season when thou camest forth out of Egypt, thou shalt roast it and eat it in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose uh, and thou shalt turn in uh, the morning and go to thy tents. Six days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord thy, good, Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work therein. Now, of course, um, this began with the observance of the Passover, uh, which, which was on the tenth day of the month. Okay? Now, what's interesting about these feasts is that Jesus Christ and ha the, the, these first feasts have been fulfilled. The feast of Passover, the unleavened bread, and uh, you know the wave offering, these have all been taken care of. These are fulfilled in Christ. That's what the Passover was a picture of, was, was, uh, was of Jesus Christ. You know, he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And if you recall, they were to, when they ate that, he told them specifically that they shall eat it with the putrance thereof. They, I mean, they weren't to gut it. They were supposed to not even remove the head. They weren't supposed to cut it up or they're not supposed to break a bone of it. That they were to roast the entire thing uh, uh, you know, whole on the fire and then they were to eat of it. And then what was ever, whatever was left over was to remain and be con consumed upon the altar. They weren't to have leftovers the next day. And that's because that's a picture of Christ's sacrifice for us, that he suffered in hell. I mean, what other, what, how else do you explain the symbology there? If he's the lamb that's being roasted on a fire, right? That's his, him paying the, uh, taking our place you know, for our sins. And of course, the leavened bread is a perfect picture of the, of the fact that Christ has purged us from our sins. Not only was he sinless, you know, and again, these are there's multi layer, there's multiple layers here that we could we could talk about each one of these feasts, and we can't really cram it all in one sermon. But the unleavened bread, you know, he 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 was without sin, so he was the perfect Lamb of God without sin. So there was no leaven, which is a picture of sin, to be found in any of their homes. They weren't to eat any unleavened bread. They weren't to have it even in their house. 
You know, we could say that's a picture of Christ. That's also a picture of what I believe Christ has done for us. He has purged us from our old sins. He's purged us from the leaven of sin in our life. We, and, you know, that starts with the Passover. They consume the lamb, and then, you know, then it's the unleavened bread that one doesn't come before the other. Um, <clears throat> you know, they have to have the Passover first, just like we have to be saved first. You know, we don't, we don't purge ourselves from our sins and then Jesus dies for us. You know, we can't do that. He has to die for us that we can be purged from our sin to be unleavened. Now, if you would, uh, turn over to Exodus chapter 12. I'm going to have you turn in quite a few places tonight, so try to keep up with me. I know it's midweek, but let's, let's perk up a little bit. Uh, and this is, you know, there's, there's some really good stuff in this passage. These feasts are fascinating. I mean, I would like to preach entire sermons on each one of these, hopefully sometime in the future. But uh, we're just going to touch on them tonight, but there's still a lot we can learn from them. Now you're there in Exodus chapter 12 where we see the, 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 uh, the, the beginning or the, the roots here of, of the Passover. It says, And the Lord spake in verse 1 unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This shall be unto you the beginning of months in the first month of the year to you, which is the month Abibs. So that's the beginning of their calendar. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, and the tenth day of this month thou shalt take them every man a lamb according to the house of father, uh, a lamb for an house. Right? So on the 10th day, they were supposed to go get the lamb. Now, the 10th day was not when they were to, to kill or slay the lamb. They were all to come together, slay the lamb, and then, and then roast it in their homes and eat it in their homes. So they were to observe the lamb. So they went and got ten, for that 10th day, they would go get a lamb, every man a lamb for his house, and then they would actually observe that lamb for three days. right? Because if you look there in verse 5, he says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day. So the 10th day they went out and they got the lamb, and then they kept it on the 14th day. So they kept it for those three days, right? Of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it in the evening. And you shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and upon the upper door post of the house, wherein they shall eat it. So they were supposed to get this lamb on the 10th day, keep it for, four day, or for three days, and then slay it on the 14th day. And not only, you know, when they slayed it, you know, they were to take the blood of it and they were to put it on the side post and the lentil of their door. And when, if we recall, you know, if you're, I mean, on the sides and on above. And, you know, it's been said, and this is probably true, that if you think about it, if you had, a, you know, the blood here and the blood here and the blood here, you know, it makes a cross. So Christ, you know, the Bible says that uh, to him give all the prophets witness. You know, if we read our Old Testament Bibles, uh, our Old Testament, you know, we'll see Christ everywhere we look if we, if we have a mind to look for it. And we let, uh, you know, if we're, we're found reading the Word of God, you know, He's going to start to show up. I mean, that's what the whole book is about. It, you know, they, all everything is pointing to Christ. So that's a great picture of Him there, not only in the, the 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 blood on the doorpost, His crucifixion, His death, but also in the Lamb itself. Now, why were they to observe it for three days? Because it was they wanted to make sure it was a Lamb without blemish and without spot, meaning they wanted to watch and see, it, make sure it didn't have a limp. You know, or, or, or whatever, you know, make sure it didn't, you know, make funny sound. I don't know what exactly we're supposed to look it out for, you know. Doesn't wag its tail at the, at the right interval. I don't know how, how meticulous they got. But they wanted to make sure, you know, this animal wasn't lame in some way. That it was a good representation of that animal. That it was perfect. That it was without blemish. Because, again, that they were to understand that that was, uh, you know, a sim that was symbolic. You know, we're going to use that word a lot tonight. Symbolic. There's a lot of symbology here. Uh, that, would, that lamb was to be symbolic of Jesus Christ, and who also was without blemish. You know, we, we, we're, we're, we are saved by the, as the precious blood of a lamb without spot, that the Bible says. So he was supposed to be, uh, that lamb was supposed to be a perfect representation of Christ. And then, of course, they took it on the 14th day. They slayed it as a congregation. They, split, they put the blood on their own doorpost and went inside and ate it. And then, uh, you know, this also... They were told to do this because why? Why God is reminding them, you know, this was an observance of the fact that they were delivered from Egypt, right? And he said, you shall remember that that was the day that he brought you out of the house of bondage. And that's symbolic of our own deliverance too. You know, we could, we could read this and think about the fact that Christ was slain for us and by his blood, you know, we're made free in Christ. That we've been delivered from the bondage of sin in our life. That we're not going to pay the penalty for sin when we die, that Christ has delivered us. Egypt is a type of the world, you know, it's, it's bondage, it's iniquity, it's sin. Now, if you would go over to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Exodus 13, 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. 
And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt out of the house of bondage, for by strength, by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This came ye out in the month Abib. So again, he's reminding them they're doing this at this time, observing all of this, not just for the symbology of the death of Christ, but also their own deliverance from Egypt, you know, which is a picture that we have. Now it says here that uh, we notice also that it lasted seven days. So we're talking about that first feast, you know, the, the Passover and the unleavened bread. It lasted seven days. If you would go over, just go back to Exodus chapter 12, if you would. And I'll read you from Exodus 20, 13, 23. It says, Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded in the time appointed of the month Abib. For in thou camest out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. Now, what, what's this? You know, there's probably a lot more we, we could even talk about the fact that it was seven days long. But one thing is to remember, you know, uh, to think about is the fact that they were delivered from Egypt, right? And if you recall the story, after they're gone out into the wilderness, you know, they're, they're thrust out, you know, they're, they're giving them jewels and they're giving them everything they needed for their journey because of, they had just, you know, gone through all those terrible pla plagues. The Egyptians had suffered. You know, of course, the last one was the death of the firstborn of every man and beast. So all the, uh, and all, all of Egypt, you know, so they're, now they're ready to thrust out the children of Israel. They want them gone far from them. And if you recall the story, you know, they, 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 they thrust them out in haste. And it says they didn't even have, they brought, they took their bread with them unleavened in their kneading troughs. They didn't even have, not that they were going to leaven it, they weren't supposed to. But it's a, you know, this unleavened bread is supposed to remind them also the fact that they were to, they were thrust out with haste from Egypt. Now, not only God delivered them with a mighty hand, but they, had, they went so quickly that they had to go with that bread unleavened that, that they went out very quickly from them. And of course, it lasted seven days because if you remember, after they'd gone into the wilderness, Pharaoh you know, gets this idea that he wants them back. And he, go, and he pursues them in the wilderness. You know, and I, I don't know that it says anywhere explicitly that it was seven days later. But you have to imagine they traveled a great distance to get to the Red Sea crossing and then Pharaoh catches up to them. I believe that that was several days journey and that it was probably seven days before Pharaoh had caught up to them that they made that journey. That's, you know, some speculation on my part, but that's what I believe. Now, <coughs> he says there in Exodus chapter 12 that there was no, you know, no leaven that was supposed to be found in their homes. You can, you can read that there in verse 15. It says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Even at the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. And again, that's symbolic of the fact that we are sinless in Christ. Not to say that we, you know, we are sinless in our life, that you know, we, we are now, because we're saved, we're without sin. We know that we have sin. You know, if we say that we have no sin, we make him a liar, and the truth is not in us. We understand that. But in Christ, you know, in God's eyes, it is this, as if we have not sinned. You know, we're justified in Christ. You know, if we do, if we do sin, you know, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and, to, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's a picture, I believe, also of the fact that we are sinless in Christ. That's why there was no leaven found in their house, because they were without sin. <coughs> you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, it says, Put, uh, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be, what, a new lump, as ye are unleavened. So in Christ, we are unleavened. You know, we are without sin in Christ. For even our Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So the Bible, you know, this is a great picture of the fact that because Christ has been slain for us, because we are in Christ, that we are, in a sense, you know, spiritually speaking, in God's eyes, unleavened, that we are without sin. We are a new lump. We are a new creature. So let's move along here because there's, there's more uh, to get into here with these other feasts. But he says there, uh, going back to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 9, seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. So they were to have the Passover, they were to observe the seven uh, days, and then they were to number uh, seven weeks, right? They were, he said, seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from the, such time as thou beginnest to put thy sickle to the corn, and thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God, with the tribute uh, of a free will offering of thine hand, which the Lord thy God, uh, uh, which, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son and thy daughter, and thy manservant, and the maidservant, and the Levite that is within thy gates, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow that are among you, in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and thou shalt observe to do these statutes. So again, 
they were to number these seven these seven weeks. That's why it's called the Feast of Weeks, right? And if you in in, in what this translates, and you see this in Acts two, they do this, and in, in what the Day of Pentecost, you know, Pente is you know uh, I believe is the Greek word for fifty, but that's that's the correlation there, and uh, <coughs> it, it's a uh, you know it's a great picture. Now remember, this first feast, these have been fulfilled, right? The the Passover we know is fulfilled. The unleavened bread is fulfilled. All these other feasts are fulfilled. And this one was also fulfilled too, we believe, and that's fulfilled in Pe the day of Pentecost. And it was the, you know, it was the, they were to bring in the, the, the first fruits. You know, it's the Feast of Weeks, or the, or the, the Feast of the Ingathering of the First Fruits. And if you think about it, you know, we know, understand that Christ was the first fruits, right? But then there was also a, uh, this other great harvest that took place in Pentecost when a great multitude was added unto them. So that's kind of the picture that, 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 that he's giving here. You know, there's going to be, you're going to put the sickle to the corn, you're going to, and then you're going to bring, your, your in-gathering, you're going to bring what you gather at this harvest 70 days later. And when were they going to bring that? After the Passover, after they, you know, they'd been made, unle you know, the, unleavened, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So get the symbology, you know, we get saved, we're unleavened in Christ, we do the works of God, and then, you know, we have a great, you know, there's, there's a, we, 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 uh, you know, we, we have a harvest. We win souls. And that's what happened back then, too. You know, they, they got saved. They were unleavened in Christ, right? And then, a, and there wasn't a lot of soul winning that took place, really, when we read the scriptures between the time Christ ascended into heaven and the day of Pentecost, right? It wasn't a very long time. But what happened was that, that great ingathering. On the day of Pentecost, they were to, you know, they, they got together and 3,000 souls were added uh, unto the church. And the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. So there was this great harvest, right? And that's the symbology there. But I really want to focus in and move on because those are, as interesting as those are, really the most interesting one is the, the last feast, right? And these are the feasts that have not yet been fulfilled. These are the feasts that Christ is going to fulfill when he returns. So, <clears throat> and really the fall feasts, as they're called, uh, are symbolic of the end of the world. You know, and, and, and this is proven by the fact in Matthew chapter 13, I'll just read for you, but if you would go to Leviticus 23, the Bible says in Matthew 13, Jesus was giving the parable of the reapers, you know, the parables of the end of the world, right? And he said, the field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. And then he says this, the harvest is the end of the world. So, that's, you know, when, we, when we're going to start talking about these fall feasts, which were, the, were, were, you know, the, took place in the fall, obviously they took place at the end when they were bringing in the harvest and things like that. You know, when we, when we understand that statement, that's very true. You know, the, the, the parable here about the end of the world being likened unto a harvest, okay? And, uh, <coughs> and that's what we're going to see here, is that all the, this last set of feasts here, these fall feasts, are symbolic of Christ's return. These are feasts that are, have yet to be fulfilled in, uh, you know, symbolically in Christ, but they one day will be. And you know, to be perfectly honest, I'm just going to scratch the surface here. Uh, you know, there, there's been great studies done where people have t taken the time to look at all the, the math. There's a, you, know, you start to study their calendar, well, you know, the, the way they would observe it, you start counting the days, you start, you know, comparing, you know, uh, uh, Daniel's 70th week. You could really make a lot of tie-ins with this and it go pretty deep. Uh, I'm not going to do that tonight for the sake of time. It's something I still want to make sure to study out for myself, make sure that it's 100% it's accurate. I don't have any reason to doubt it, but I'm not just going to, you know, regurgitate everything, you know, without checking it out. But it's, it's very deep and it's very interesting. And, uh, and I want to just touch on it tonight because um, I think there's a lot we can learn from it. One, mainly, is how deep the Word of God is. I mean, the, the Bible is a very deep book. And, you know, we, we would do well to study it. And we'd probably be amazed if we would actually take the time to really look into some things and dig into them. Uh, God has some great treasures for those that were willing to go and seek for it in His Word. But the fall feast here, they were to begin in the seventh month. Now, you're in Leviticus 23. I want you to keep something there. Keep a bookmark in Leviticus 23. He said in Leviticus 23, verse 24, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Now again, remember, these feasts had, you know, they were, they were feasts within the feasts. So there's really three feasts going on here. 
There's three elements to this feast or this, this time that they were coming together. The first thing that we see there, the first element is the blowing of the trumpets, right? That was to happen on the first day of the month. He said, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. Now, I'll probably, now I know when I read that and I heard somebody else start to begin to preach about that, I thought, I got it. That's talking about the rapture, right? Wrong. That's not right. It's not talking about the rapture. You know, I could, you know, we might think that very quickly. A lot of people preach that and teach that because we understand, you know, hey, we're talking about Christ's return. We also associate that with the trumpet of when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and, and, and Christ comes back at the last trump. But uh, that's not what this is referring to. It's, it's actually uh, referring to another point in the prophetic timeline. He says here uh, that the blowing of the trumpets on the first day, right? Now, one of the first things to notice there is that it's trumpets, right? Not just one trump. You know, when Christ comes at the last trump shall sound, right? That's, that's one trump that's going to resound. But this is a blowing of trumpets. Now, if you would, uh, again, look there and uh, well, keep something there, but go over to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. And again, I'm not probably going to do this all the justice that it deserves because there's a lot here to unpack and I don't want to rush. You know, I'm, I'm already rushing already. I can feel it. And I've, when I start to rush, I start to lose people. And I, and I get a little lost myself. So I'm trying to slow down and make sure we get what we can out of it. Okay, but this, there's a lot here. And, and really, without going deep into, you know, Daniel, the book of Daniel and his 70th week, you know, which is a whole other, you know, that is a whole other series of sermons right there to try and uh, expound and understand Daniel's 70th week. But there's a lot of tie in here, okay? <clears throat> the Bible says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, And he shall confirm uh, the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And the over, for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even on the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. So what is this talking about? This is what's referred to as the abomination of desolation, right? During Daniel's 70th week, which is the last week that, you know, which is the, the, the last week that has yet to be fulfilled, you know, with the, the tribulation, the rise of the Antichrist, Christ's return, God's pouring out his wrath, and the beginning of the millennium. You know, the, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, the Daniel's 70th week here, right? So that he, uh, what he's showing us here is that he, what we want, want to understand is that when he's, these trumpets that are at this feast, these are not symbolic of the rapture, but these are actually telling us about the time when the Antichrist is going to come to power. And if you recall, the Antichrist, you know, when he gets to that, right before that midpoint, his, he receives a deadly wound in his, heel, in his head and he's healed and he ascends out of the bottomless pit. Right? And he goes in to, and into the temple and he claims himself to be God. And the false prophet sets up an image and he causes uh, both small and great to worship the image and to receive a mark in their hand and their forehead. And whosoever not worship the beast you know, was slain. Right? And that's what kicks off the great tribulation. We know leading up to that is the time of tribulation. Right? And then when the, but when all that takes place, when the, when the Antichrist is killed, Revived, comes out of this uh, bottomless pit, sets up the image, then begins what's called that short frame, time frame right before God, before the rapture of the great tribulation. When, when, uh, the, when the devil and the Antichrist make war with the saints and overcome them. And except those days would be short and there should no flesh be saved. And we know those days are cut short when Christ returns. But what this is showing us, uh, if you would, um, Go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <coughs> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. We're saying, look, don't be troubled about anybody who's telling you that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, isn't it ironic how many people try to do that, even in Baptist churches? I don't know how many Baptist camp meetings I've sat through and they, they've said, the Lord could come tonight before the service is over, trying to trouble you that the day of the Lord is at hand and saying, you know, he could come at any moment. When this is saying, look, don't let anybody trouble you, saying it could come at any moment. It is at hand, right? Let no man deceive you by any means, he says. Meaning, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to try to deceive you about the second coming of Christ, the timing of it. And what did he say? For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. 
and that man of sin be revealed. That's the Antichrist, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So we know that Christ's coming is not going to happen until the Antichrist reveals himself and claims to be God. Right? So until we see that happen, then we can rest assured that Jesus Christ is not coming. That, that has to happen first. And uh, that, you know, I don't want to go off on that. And, and this isn't a sermon necessarily about the, you know, the pre-tribulation rapture and how it's false. But this is just tying in again with Daniel's 70th week, what we're reading here, that there's going to come a time when the Antichrist sets him up himself as God and kicks off this great tribulation. And what happens at that time is that he makes war with the saints, okay? <clears throat> the false prophet, you know, he sets up the image. They all worship him. And, <clears throat> of course, when this happens, this all occurs, this, this, this uh, man of sin being revealed, this setting up of the image, him, this abomination of desolation that happens in the exact middle right of, the, of that time and it is symbolic of the great tribulation or, or I'm, not, I'm sorry the, 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 the feast happens at the exact middle right so just think about it if you have a 12 month year the first day of the seventh month would be right in the middle right so it, 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 that's what happens there. Uh, that ha happens the exact middle of the year, and it is symbolic of the Great Tribulation that taking place, which takes place when? In the middle of all that. When you have the Tribulation and God's wrath, you have right in the middle the abomination of desolation, and there's that time frame of, of, the, uh, uh, of the Great Tribulation. So that's some of the symbology there. So that's what these trumpets are referring to. And you say, well, how does that work? Now go over to Numbers chapter 29. Numbers chapter 29. Because what happens is, is war is declared upon God's people. It's just all out, you know, he's trying to, and, you know, and, and, and people, people really fret about this time. You know, I remember people uh, recently reading an email. Somebody said they were real concerned about, you know, what was going to happen during this time. You know, what kind of physical suffering they were going to have to endure during this time. Well, you might not even make it to that time. <laughs> you know, there's going to be a lot leading up to that. But I believe in this time, like he's saying, well, maybe will it be like the Inquisitions, you know, where they're doing all these terrible things to people? I don't believe it is. I believe he knows that he hath a little time. The devil's going to come down with great fury because he knows he hath a little time. And he's going to try to wipe out Christians as quick as he can. He's not going to take his time in trying to make people suffer. He's trying to overthrow the world. He's trying to overthrow God. He's trying to take over everything. So he's going to start wiping people out as fast as he can. So I don't believe he's going to take the time, you know, put you on the rack and stretch you out and, you know, do all the terrible things that they did back then. It's just going to, it's going to be beheadings. Yep. You know, it's going to, and you know what? That's quick. You know, beheading is not the worst way to go. You know, good news tonight, folks. If you don't get anything out, you know, beheading is not as bad as it sounds, right? You know, uh, in fact, you know, if, if, if we, if I make it to that time, I've often joked, you know, and maybe I shouldn't, but. If there's a line for beheadings, you know, sign me up. I'll, I'll, I'll cut in line, right? You know, forgive the pun. But, you know, I'm, you know, beheading and then it's bam, in glory, right? So anyway, I don't know why I went off on that. But the point being here is that, you know, this, this feast, this blowing of the trumpets, this, this feast of the trumpets, which kicks off this last feast, you know, occurs here in the, in tor uh, towards the, in, in the middle of the year, which correlates with, with God's wrath you know, and the, and the abomination of desolation being set up in the middle of the tribulation, you know, that, that those seven years, Daniel's 70th week. <coughs> and what happens is, is they declare war, right? God, war is declared to God's, God's people. And look here in Numbers 29 and verse 1. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no ser servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. So this isn't just one trumpet being blown. This is a multitude of trumpets that are being blown. Okay? This isn't just you know, the trumpet of the Lord sounding and Christ coming back. This is multiple trumpets. Now, what's, now what significance does that have in Scripture? Go over to Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10. <clears throat> so again, they're blowing multiple trumpets at this time. And it says here in Numbers chapter 10, verse 9, And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets. Plural again. 
and shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. So that's a picture of what's going on here. This blowing of the trumpets is that to remind, you know, they didn't know it back then, but we, with, you know, looking back, can look and understanding all, having all the scripture and being able to understand all these things can look back and say, oh, this is symbolic of the fact that when these terrible events do kick off, you know, they blew the trumpets back then, you know, and, and what are those symb trumpets symbolic of? That there's war, there's conflict, and that we are going to be remembered before our God. That God is not just going to let it go on and on and on. Remember, it, it, except those days uh, uh, should be cut short, there should no flesh remain, meaning they are going to be cut short. That God is going to come and stop that. You know, of course, there's going to be many people that suffer, but God is, you know, and even those in heaven say, you know, oh Lord, how just, holy, and true, how long does sound avenge our blood upon the earth? And he tells them that they should rest a little while until the rest of their brethren uh, should suffer as they had. But there's going to come a time when Christ says, okay, that's enough. Now it's time to come. Right? And that happens after the abomination of desolation. That happens after the, 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 uh, the, the, the false prophet and the beast make war with the saints. Okay? <laughs> so that's what's symbolic there. This, is not, this isn't symbolic of the, of the rapture. It's symbolic of the great tribulation kicking off. And that's what I, that's what I believe. Now, if you remember, uh, if you, it, it, the Day of Atonement was to be on the 10th day of the month. So they had the blowing of the trumpets, and then the, the Day of Atonement was on the 10th day of the month, right? Now, go over to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23, if you kept something there. <coughs> Leviticus 23, it says in verse 27, Also on the 10th day of the 7th month, there shall be a Day of Atonement. So it's the same month, right? Same feast that we're talking about. The first day was the blowing of the trumpets. Then on the tenth day we have the day of atonement. And it shall be in holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls in an offering, uh, in an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You shall do new work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. And of course that's going to be symbolic of Christ's return when he does come back for his people. And again, I'm not even, there's so much more here that we could talk about when you actually get into the, the, the counting the days and the, the, how this all ties in together. It, it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, I, and I, I'll, I'll, maybe one day we'll, when I can spend more time on this exact thing, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more. But this is symbolic of Christ's return. Turn over to Leviticus chapter 25. Because if you recall, there is a time, there is a time in Scripture when a trumpet is sounded, right? And it is a picture of Christ's return, right? And he says here in Leviticus 25, verse 8, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of year unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the uh, seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. And thou shalt cause uh, the trumpet of Jubilee to sound through the tenth day of the seventh month, right? So, of course, this wasn't, every seventh day or every tenth day of every seventh month but this was you know every 50 years basically that they were to sound this trumpet of jubilee right but it was to take place on that day that same day so every 50 years they blow this trumpet and it was on the tenth day of the seventh month right which is 10 days after they had blown the 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 the, 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 the memorial of trumpets the blowing of the trumpets right so then they had this other trump that sounded now this trumpet is a picture of Christ's return, right? It's the trumpet of Jubilee. In the day of atonement, you shall make the trumpet sound through all the land. And what is that? It's talking about this is the day of liberty when we are set free, right? They, if you recall the day of Jubilee when they blew that trump, every man was forgiven. All debts were forgiven. Bondmen and, and, and people who were in, in, in service to other people were allowed to go back to their home. Uh, if you had sold your land, you were, to give, you were given back your inheritance. It was like God just wiped the, the slate completely clean and everything kind of, everyone just got a big reset. And everyone, you know, there was no, you know, that, that at least once in a generation, people had a chance to start fresh, you know, and, and uh, it's a day of liberty. It's a day of deliverance. It's a day of being set free from bondage. And of course, we're talking here about, you know, earthly things, but it's also a picture of the fact that, you know, we are going to be set free one day in Christ when he comes and, and, and redeems us unto himself. So it's a day of liberty. And that's referred to in Romans uh, chapter 8. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chap chapter 2. It says in Romans chapter 8, because the creature itself also 
shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What's that referring to? When Christ returns. You know, that, that's what that's referring to. When we shall, be re, uh, uh, we shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption under the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's the liberty that we wait for. We wait for Christ to come and to set us free, you know, not just spiritually, but also physically, to take us back and, and, and uh, you know, to receive us unto himself. So that's what that's referring to, that re referring to there. And when did that take place? It took place 10 days after the blowing of the trumpets. Then you have this, this blowing of the, the trumpet of Jubilee. So you can see how this is all symbolic of, you know, the, uh, of Christ's return. These are things that have not yet been fulfilled. You know, they, but these are things that we can look at in Scripture and say, wow, this is amazing. And again, I'm not even <laughs> beginning to do this justice tonight of, of how, how deep you can really go with this one here. But look here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, he says, and for none of those things which ye sh uh, would, uh, uh, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and you shall have tribulation. What ten days? So there it is again. You know they're going to suffer all this tribulation these ten days. They have the blowing of the trump, right? The trumpets at the beginning. The great tribulation is getting kicked off symbolically. That's what that's representing. They have tribulation ten days, and then there's that blowing of the trump. You know the day of jubilee. Uh, and where they're set free. He said, look, you're going to have tribulation 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So then you have uh, the last part of it, of course, was the tabert Feast of Tabernacles, which was five days later, on the 15th day of the month. Now, what is that symbolic of? Well, that's symbolic of, of the millennium. You know, that's a great picture of the millennium. And I look here in Leviticus 23. I should have to keep something there. So I apologize if you turned away, but go back to Leviticus chapter 23. That was the last part of the last feast that they were to have of that, of that year was, uh, you know, the Feast of Tabernacles. So, again, they had the blowing of the trumpets. And then there's that, you know, the, that, 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 uh, <coughs> the Day of Atonement on the 10th day. Every 50 years, it was a year of Jubilee. They would blow a trumpet, right? And then on the Feast of Tabernacles was the last part, which was on the 15th day, which is symbolic of the millennium, which, you know, all falls in line prophetically exactly how things are going to play out in the end times you're going to have the great tribulation Christ's return the god pouring out his wrath a short time and then him coming back and setting up his reign on earth and we will rule and reign with him in the millennium it says here in leviticus chapter 23 verse 34 speak unto the children of israel saying the 15th day of this seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the lord on the first day shall be in holy convocation. He shall do no servile work. Jump down to verse 40. And he shall take on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And he shall rejoice with the Lord your God seven days. And you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord uh, seven days in the year. It shall be a statute for your, uh, forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths seven days. And all Israelites uh, born shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I, I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when they brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. Now, uh, if you would go back to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 16, and we'll read about this some more. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Thou shalt observe the feast of tabernacles seven days after thou, thou hast gathered in thy corn and thine wine. So this is, of course, symbolic, I believe, of uh, the the Feast of Tabernacles, right? And they, so basically he's telling them, look, when you do this, you're going to take all these tree branches, and palm trees, right? That which is, which is, recall, that's what they used to, uh, you know, celebrate Christ, uh, you know, proclaim Christ when he was coming in to Jerusalem three days before his crucifixion, when they laid down palm trees in the way and cried Hosanna. But um, it's symbolic of that, but also the fact that th they were to dwell in these booths. So they're basically to make these structures out of these willows and trees of the brook, all these things that they just listed. They were to dwell in them during, these, the, during this time. You know, they weren't to just you know, set up their own tent. They had to go there and set up these booths on site, and they were to dwell in them. And you know, we never see them doing that, by the way. That's, you know, God told them to do a lot of things. We never see them in Scripture. I don't, I don't believe that they ever did. But uh, they were supposed to do that, and that's a picture of the fact that, you know, that's, that's a picture of the millennial reign of Christ, that we are going to dwell with Christ. We're going to go be where He is, on, and we're going to be in His kingdom, in His presence. And if you would, turn over to Revelation chapter 7, 
and we'll, we'll look at one more thing here, Revelation chapter 7. And you can kind of see how this ties in. <clears throat> it says in Revelation chapter 7, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, verse 9, excuse me, verse 9, which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and what in their hands? Palms, right? Which is one of the things they were told to take down during the Feast of Tabernacles and to use to build the structure. So that's a great picture of the fact uh, uh, of the millennial here where they're all dwelling with Christ. We'll look at verse 16, which is another great tie-in. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore, no, anymore, neither shall the sun light on them or any heat. You know, that reminded me of these booths. I mean, if they're getting in these booths, you know, they're blocked from the sun. You know, they're, they're blocked from the heat. They're, they're dwelling uh, with God, you know, as it were. And we understand that's because they're going to be in the New Jerusalem and Jesus is the light of it. But there's all this symbology here through all these feasts. And, you know, uh, I would like to take the time, hopefully in future sermons, to, to really spend the time to, to dig into these because they're fascinating. You know, and, and again, I'm just kind of, I know we're going chapter by chapter, verse by verse uh, through the book here. and We're just kind of touching on these things tonight. And, you know, Deuteronomy just kind of touches on it here. Leviticus, as you see there, verse 23, or chapter 23, is really another passage where they really start to dig into it. You get more details. You get some more out of numbers. And there's a lot we could do. But I believe, you know, hopefully I, I've, I've shown you that there is a lot of symbology here that not only in the things that have already taken place. You know, we all understand the Passover. We all understand the unleavened bread. You know, we understand the Feast of Weeks. Uh, you know, but what about these future ones? You know, there's still you know, a lot that has yet to, to, to take place. You know, and that should remind us that you know, God is not finished. You know, God is still working today. That there's still a lot more to come that, that has not yet come to pass. That God is going to do great things in the future. You know, and uh, <clears throat> you know, it, what, a, what a wonderful thing it would be for us to live through that time. You know, as trying as it might be, as, as perhaps even scary as that might be, we would be able to, we understand that we would be able to see uh, great things. I mean, what if we were to make it through that great tribulation? You know, that's one thing I've always thought about is the fact that maybe, maybe instead of me taking, maybe I wouldn't cut in line at the right. beheading. You know, maybe I would rather try and hang out and, and do some great works for Christ and Amen. preach the gospel and, and keep my neck as long as, keep, keep my head and my shoulders as long as I could. And if I made it through all that, you know, Unto the coming of Christ, I mean, not a lot of people are going to get to see that. I mean, don't get me wrong, the view is probably just as good from the other side coming back with Christ. You know, but I mean, what a wonderful thing to stay here and to never, never see death. Think about that. There's going to be a generation in this world that never even dies. When that, you know, that's a very rare group of people. But they're going to have to, they're going to be, they're going to have to pay the price for that. They're going to have to go through some, 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 some suffering, some tribulation. It might be our generation. It might be the generations to come. We don't know. But one thing we can learn from, from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16 tonight is that God has done great things in the past and that God is going to be doing great things in the future. Let's go ahead and pray.